or not, we run, let's get with the flow Feeling the rhythm, the bounce, remind me Watch a kulala, changa mka kiasi, haya basi Up, up and away we go, from the bottom we rise Look at the light in our eyes, see, believe it, I see no lies We run, let's get with the flow Feeling the rhythm, the bounce Remind me, watch a kulala Changa mkagi, we rise Let the fast go Get with the flow, feeling the rhythm, the bounce, you mind me, watch a kulala, changa mka kiasi, haya basi Up and away we go, from the bottom we rise, look at the light in our eyes, see, believe it, I see no lies We run, let's get with the flow Feeling the rhythm, the bounce, you mind me Watch a kulala, changa mka kiasi, haya basi Up, up and away we go From the bottom we rise Look at the light in our eyes See, believe it, I see no lies Fast go We run, let's get with the flow Feeling the rhythm, the bounce, you mind me Watch a kulala, changa mka kiasi, haya basi Up and away with it, I see no lies, fast go We run, let's get with the flow Feeling the rhythm, the bounce You mind me, watch a kulala Changa mka kiasi, haya basi Up, up and We run, changa mka kiasi, haya basi Up, up and away we go From the bottom we rise Look at the light in our eyes Believe it, I see no lies Feeling the rhythm, the bounce, you mind me, watch a kulala, changa mka kiasi, yeah, see, haya basi, up, I see, believe it, I see, no lies, fast, go. With the flow, feeling the rhythm, the bounce, you mind me, watch a kulala, changa mka kiasi, haya basi Up, up and away we go, from the bottom we rise, look at the light in our eyes, see, believe it, I see no lies, fast go Good evening everyone um, welcome to this XPSA session. My name is Njeri Bobure, I'm a product designer at Marathon. Um, today we are going to discuss the topic unveiling the forces behind product success. Um, so let's get started. It's the goal of every product designer or founder to create a product that achieves product market fit and becomes the leader in their category 
and some products succeed at this, some don't, and some become wildly successful, and we term those products disruptors. So for disruptors, there was a time before their existence and a time after. Um, when we assess the merits of success, so what led to success, what led to failure, we often take a very narrow lens. But for today's discussion, I'd like us to zoom out, consider more factors than just the actual product and how those factors interact. And then beyond that, we are going to rely on hindsight because it's only with the benefit of hindsight that we are able to tell a full story, that we are able to, you know, take a rear view mirror, mirror uh, view, take a view um, from there. <laughs> Let me take that again. Um, through the rear view mirror, we're able to see things clearly the dust are settled, so everything is clear, you can tell a story. Um, so for today's discussion, we'll name those factors, define each one of them with an example, and then look at three disruptive products and conclude. Um, so yeah, let's get started. The factors we are going to discuss today are timing, innovation, and luck. Uh, there could be more, there definitely are more, but these are the ones I chose for today's discussion. And to get an understanding of each, we are going to use an example to really drive the point home. So let's start with um, timing. A great example of how you can sometimes be too early or too late to deliver your product or solution would be Kodak. I am old enough to have grown up around film cameras. Um, you'd say you're going to develop film so that you could have actual photos. And I know for some of you, this story is relatable. Like you have guests over and my mom, for, for me, my mom would, um, after they've had tea, she'd tell me, Sherry, go get the albums and keep the guests entertained. And we'd flip through the album for a few hours, and I had a story for every photo, even the ones that were taken long before I was born. And Kodak was behind many of our memories. Actually, the phrase, a Kodak moment, meant capturing a happy moment with family, with friends. But it's interesting to know that um, Kodak actually had a prototype of the digital camera in the late 70s. But the technology was too early. It was, um, the quality wasn't there, so they kept it aside. The time was not right. And they continued to profit off film and the sale of film and cameras and they failed to foresee or to anticipate how quickly the digital revolution would happen. They were the incumbents, you're slow, you know, why disrupt ourselves? Um, it's working to continue to work. And the rest is history. Um, Kodak is no longer what it was. And now a Kodak moment means an incumbent or a market leader has failed to respond to the times. They failed to innovate, they failed to disrupt themselves. So you have to get your timing right. The next factor is innovation. Innovation refers to the different ways you can come up with solving a problem, so tackling a problem or delivering on a need. Airbnb, the story is told, uh, two founders, their friends, one of the founders comes over to the house of the other, um, he's staying over for a short time, there was a concert in town or something, and they decide that um, the price of hotels is too, it's too high for such a short stay, 
So let me stay over at your house. And he stays at you know, on an air mattress. And in the morning, he has breakfast. And, and then they were like, hmm, I think there's something here. How many people find hotels too expensive, too stuffy, and would like to host people or be hosted by friendly people? And in the West and in high trust societies, you can see that this is an easy preposition. I have children, they're old enough to go to college. I have rooms in my house that I can rent out. I have a house in the Hamptons. I only stay in the summer months. So why not rent it out the rest of the time? So the innovation was how you can use the sharing economy and technology as an intermediary. So you share resources. I need short-term housing. You have the housing and Airbnb is the go-between. Um, it's the same idea that Uber had for rideshare. share. So that was a key innovation. And again, they benefited from timing. As I said, it's an interplay. Last is luck. Luck can be many things. It can be when you're conducting research, for example, and you, you're, you're focused on finding a solution in a certain direction, you may stumble on a finding that may not be what you're after, but it may prove useful. Or it could be your competitor is having missteps and they're failing to course correct. Can you jump on that? Um, a good example of luck is the microwave and how it came to be. So the story is in the 50s, uh, a scientist at a lab in a company called Raytheon was doing research about uh, lasers. And he's in the lab moving about end to end and he had a chocolate bar in his coat pocket. And as he moved around, he noticed that the bar had melted. Now, you'll forgive me for not having the science technicalities, but the point is one of the rays that were, they were being emitted in the lab turned out to be what they called microwaves. And they were good for heating. So you see, they were after lasers, but they've encountered a different kind of solution. So it was that discovery that they then leveraged to create microwave ovens. Now, as I said earlier, there are product, uh, products called disruptors, for which there was a time before their existence and a time after. I'd like us to explore how they benefited from an interplay of all three. So timing was right, they got lucky, and they innovated. And for the first example, we're going to talk about the iPhone, a popular product, um, one of the best-selling products of all time, a market leader to this day. Competitors look to the iPhone to see what to do, what not to do, what functionality to drop, what to add. And to truly understand the context of what was happening when it was created, I'll take you back to, as I said, we're relying on hindsight and nostalgia to what existed before. On your screen, you're seeing two phones. One is a Nokia, one is a Blackberry. Um, you probably owned one of these phones or something like it. If it's not you, it was your parent or someone you know. These were the precursors to the iPhone. So they were the first generation of smartphones. They were durable. Um, we could drop it. It was intact. They tried their best to combine form and function. They delivered functionality. That was, you know, the primary um, need for a phone at the time, which was texting, calling, and um, yeah, messaging and calling. But these phones, the ones that were on the higher end, so not your 3310s, these ones in particular, are starting to push the boundaries of functionality. Like on the Nokia, you can see on the screen, it says email. So 
sending emails was a big sell for these phones, early access to the internet. But the heavy lifting that these phones did, and something we may now not really appreciate or take for granted, is that they helped us as mobile phone users to establish what we call in product design a mental model. So a mental model of how a phone should work. In this case, so let me define what a mental model is. It's your expectation of how something should work. An example is you go to a website you've, that you've never visited before, but you know and you expect that when you click on the logo on the corner, the button is going to take you back home to the home page of the website. That's because that model, that mental model in your mind was established before. So these phones came with manuals, thick manuals, explaining all manner of things in granular detail. This is how you send a message. This is where you go to find your settings and on and on. But the iPhone by and large was able to be launched with functionality. You could turn it on and you're using it straight out of the box. Now, let's get to the good stuff. Uh, for this part, I'm going to play a short clip of Steve introducing the phone uh, at the launch event. Uh, so let's have a listen. It's a short clip, and then you get back to the slides. Thanks. A widescreen iPod with touch controls, a revolutionary mobile phone, and a breakthrough internet communications device. An iPod, a phone, and an internet communicator. An iPod, a phone. Are you getting it? These are not three separate devices. This is one device. And we are calling it iPhone. Today, today, Apple is going to reinvent the phone. Yeah, so two things um, as pertains timing. One which he has emphasized in this clip, technology had come far enough that you could have multiple functionality on one device. What previously would have been three different things was now in one. And the timing also allowed for the iPhone to be launched with a fully massive, well, not fully, but a large enough touch screen that they got rid of the physical keyboard. When you think about it, the QWERTY keyboard, the physical one, was always in your way, even when you don't need it. So say you're watching a video or whatever, it was always in your way. Your experience could never be fully massive. But for this, it only came up when you needed it. They had just perfected touchscreen technology just enough that it could be on this phone. So this was in the mid-2000s. So that's as far as timing goes. They got lucky because shortly after the phone launches, BlackBerry executives asked, okay, so how are you going to respond? Um, this seems serious. What do you plan to do? And they're like, hmm, we're good. Um, our customers find this to be enough. They don't need all that um, halabaloo about a touch screen. Um, they like the feel of the phone. We are good. And hindsight again is 2020. So we can only say it was a misstep for now. The customers did stay with them, but ultimately BlackBerry is no longer there. And we know what happened to Nokia. As far as innovation goes, I'd argue that the key step that they took as far as product experience goes is the App Store. And for this, Let's rely on another example. 
So your 3310, if you remember, had, you could call, you could text, right? But it had a snake game, if you remember, and maybe a calculator. So if you wanted to amuse yourself, you'd play the game. The next version had the snake game, a calculator, and maybe radio functionality. And then on the next version, Nokia would give you the snake game, a calculator, the radio, and maybe now you could access email. What am I driving at? Functionality was delivered very slowly. And it was at the behest of the manufacturer to decide what you got. Apple came in and said, we are going to outsource this, outsource this function to developers. We are going to create, create a platform where they upload what they create, the functionality they create, and it's for you, the user, to decide what you want on your phone. So if you're into gaming, you got gaming apps. If you're into productivity, you got email, you got what came after, and so on and so on. So for the first time, your phone was yours. They all looked the same, but my apps were mine, yours were yours based on your needs. And it set off a flywheel where users gave feedback to developers. Your app is good. Please add this. This isn't working. Developers improved their apps. Devs went to iPhone and said to Apple and said, um, we want to our apps to do this and this, but they can't. Please improve your hardware. And so they were far ahead. BlackBerry never did this. Um, Nokia, unfortunately, didn't. Later, they joined up with Google. And um, yeah, this was a key innovation. It set them apart. It's still a money maker for them, a huge money maker uh, to this day. And yeah, so we've covered all three. And uh, the next disruptor we are going to look at is from another category, um, Spotify. Um, I'm a power user myself. Uh, when you think of Spotify, you think of music. But now they've added podcasts, um, e-books, you name it. Um, yeah, so Spotify is music in your pocket. But um, I want to set the scene for what was going on around the time when they were launched, why they got their timing right, how they got lucky, and, you know, the same template we've used for Apple. So it's the 2000s, the mid-2000s, and two things are happening music piracy is at an all-time high. Um, a site called LimeWire was famous for it. Um, you could get all kinds of music files. Um, and if you are unfortunate, you could also download viruses and all manner of malware to your device. And physical media was in decline. So people are no longer buying DVDs, CDs, vinyl. Um, Apple had lot, uh, already yeah it had been launched the ipod was in use but not wide enough for the music industry to capture the profits they needed to they had failed to anticipate how huge the shift would be to digital and so they were scrambling um nobody knew how to respond and then here comes uh the startup called spotify founded by two Swedish entrepreneurs. They come to the music industry executives and they say, look, we have a solution which we think could work for you. We'd like for you to license your music to us. We'll house it on our platform. We'll do the marketing for the platform. It's called Spotify. We get users, they pay us a fee every month. We split that money. And for a group, they were skeptical, you can imagine. Negotiations took some time, but this is how they got lucky. Imagine that you are a shop owner and you go to your supplier in China 
and you have 1 million USD, not the Kenya shilling, you know how that's going. And with your 1 million, you want to secure enough stock to last you for a while. So let's say, because I don't have particulars, let's say the deals they signed with the record labels lasted 10 years. So you go to them, you say, this is what I have up front. And so you, you're going to your supplier. Uh, it's still the metaphor I'm using. And it turns out that the nature of goods that you purchase in this example, which is linked to Spotify, is goods that you can sell over and over and over again, multiple times a day to different people. Your supplier adds inventory for the same price that you agreed to 10 years ago. It's still the same 1 million. You're locked in for a long-term deal. And so they were able to contain their costs from very early. So once they secured the inventory, which was in the millions, and as I said, it doesn't age, it doesn't go out of style. If anything, it becomes more valuable the older it is. There are so many um, types of songs, so many types of genres. I think the message is home. They could now focus on building their product. Timing-wise, they were on time. The mental model that I said, your expectation of how something should work had been set by the iPod. People knew that you could have music on a device that existed in your pocket, essentially. Um, the I, the um, the app store had been launched, so they had a path for distribution. Internet connectivity was becoming widespread, so you could log into the app at any time. So they are lucky, they are on time. And the key insight or the key innovation that Spotify delivered that set them apart at the time is we take it for granted now, but when you look, when you downloaded the app, initially you played what you liked, what you knew, what was familiar to you. But they realized if they're going to keep users coming back to keep things fresh, interesting, they would have to deliver personalization and customization of your experience. So they used your key, your initial um, listening habits to understand what you like and to start delivering mixes and recommendations for genres you may not have thought of, artists who are similar to the ones you like. And it still drives, um, it's a key feature now. You can't live without it. There's Spotify radio, there's daily charts, what's new. Um, dive back to what you liked and they keep innovating. They found a way to make um, surveillance personalized with um, uh, the wrapped feature. You feel like you understood. This is the kind of artist you like. This is where you rank um, in the listenership and so on and so forth. So, yeah. There's a time before Spotify and a time after. And for our last example, we are going to go further afield to, again, look at the interplay of timing, luck, and innovation. At an example in a field that is also creative, um, that I encountered and I, I thought to share because it shows that, you know, you can, it, you can see this mix anywhere is what I'm trying to say. Um, and it's from art and the product is The Starry Night, a painting by Vincent Van Gogh, arguably his magnum opus, um, beloved, uh, most recognizable from his past catalog. The story behind the influences of this painting uh, is a really interesting story. I highly encourage you to read about him, read his work, 
his influences, um, his story. Um, he suffered a lot from mental health issues, but even in the midst of his pain, you know, he was able to leave us with a lot of beauty. So the story of this painting and many others from this time in his life starts in Japan. It's 1853 and the man pictured on your screen, this is how the Japanese um, depicted him, um, Matthew Perry. Commodore Matthew Perry has arrived at the shores of Japan um, at the behest of the US president at the time to demand that they open up for trade. Japan had been a very insular society at the for like they had, yeah, it had been in a period of isolation for nearly 200 years at this point. And the Commodore delivered the message that I'll be back in a year. You have time to think about it. So we can either trade nicely or we'll invade. Either way, you know, you're going to comply. And the Japanese did a lot of soul searching and they didn't have a naval fleet. They didn't have defenses, so they decided to comply. And that's how Japan opened up. Now, as a result of that, that when trade commenced in the years following, Japanese art and cultural artifacts started making their way to the West. They were curiosities, you know, oriental curiosities. Um, they were not, for some, they were not um, treated very seriously, but for Van Gogh, he saw he saw something that he could adopt, a different way of approaching art. And I'll tell you why it was such a revelation for him uh, through an example. This is a typical Western painting at the time, so by Monet. And if, like me, you have a Western lens of looking at things. Your eyes were immediately drawn to the lady and the baby in the foreground. And then you took on the larger, you know, the background. So whether I don't know, those are flowers, or it could be a, just a bush, you know. So Western art, by and large, always had a focal point. Your eyes were always trained to look at something. But Eastern art, by and large, was something like this, an epic scene. Your eyes can go anywhere. You're taking in so much detail. So here I can tell it's misty. Those are mountains or hills. We are in possibly a lake. And that tiny, in the foreground, there's a tiny canoe and there's someone rowing away and there are birds. And as I said, it looks like it's misty, so it could be the morning. This is what Western art was like. It was epic. It was a whole scene. And so photos or copies of Japanese art would be taken by the people selling them to the West as curiosities, packed in volumes. So you'd buy a book full of paintings like this. And unfortunately, many of these kinds of paintings, we don't know the artists. Um, so yeah, largely that was the case. Um, so Van Gogh began a period of trying to embody that type of way of thinking. On the left is the original by an artist called Hiroshige. He was particularly famous, so we know his work. And on the right is a recreation by Van Gogh. And he did many such copies, trying to take the best of himself, but also add to his method. So 
it was color, it was focal point, it was detail. And he did that over and over. He had other artists who he was talking to at the time. This is wonderful. Let's try this. Let's do it this way. There's beauty here. I should also mention that he was lucky because his younger brother was an art dealer. At the time, Van Gogh was not what we know him to be today. He was struggling, um, selling his artwork for next to nothing. But he had a very supportive brother, and the letters between them are very touching. Um, so his brother would buy him those books once you know they got to Paris. They were living in France at the time. And so he practiced and practiced and practiced at innovating this new way. And finally, we got to scenes like this. Um, so much detail. There's so much going on. You see the night sky. You see the town. You see diners. You see people walking across the road. Um, yeah. Uh, so the timing was right. Japanese art made its way. He was lucky he had access to the materials and he was open-minded enough to realize that there's something here. And yeah, but it doesn't get more successful than that. And so my conclusion would be, as we analyze success or failure, let's zoom out let's you know have a broader view of what it takes um, you could do everything right with your product or your service and you could still fail so in success be humble about it in failure be forgiving of yourself or anyone else and in our day-to-day -day activities of creativity in our research in our product design in your own field, be aware, um, recognize when you get lucky, know the times you're living in. We live now in an era of AI. Who knows what that will bring, the kinds of innovations it will bring. How can you leverage that? Are you, are you with the times? Are you, can you recognize it wasn't be possible before, but it is now and seek to find new ways of solving problems, seek new ways of approaching challenges and offering solutions. That's the lesson for us now. And I'm grateful to Lian Munyori, Don Owino and Emily Kibai for helping me organize my thoughts on this topic. And thank you too for making time to join me. Um, I hope I've provoked some thoughts and I look forward to reading your epic story in the future once it's all said and done. Um, thank you and have a great evening. We run, skip with the flow, feeling the rhythm, the bounce, you mind me, watch a kulala, changa munga kiasi, haya basi, up, up and away we go, from the bottom we rise, look at the light in our eyes, see, believe it, I see, no lies, fast though. Skip with the flow, feeling the rhythm, the bounce, you mind me, watch a kulala, changa munga kiasi, haya basi, up, up and away we go, from the bottom we rise, look at the light in our eyes, see, believe it, I see, no lies, fast though.